Thank you so much for being here. It is the most uh, exciting thing in the world to see a group of people who are so committed to understanding the inst uh, institution of the Constitution in the world that even on a beautiful Friday afternoon, when they could be doing a thousand different things, you are right here right now. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to my colleague, Professor Mike McConnell, for organizing this panel to, uh, and the conference, and to Nathan Chapman for organizing uh, and helping everything come together. I want to just make a very few brief uh, opening remarks, and then uh, we'll turn it over to our panel. And I want to start with a journey to the United States-Mexico border, which can be a dangerous place. And just to be very clear, I don't mean that the uh, degree of uh, physical well-being that you might have is necessarily threatened. You know, every place has its pros and cons, but actually the U.S.-Mexico border is remarkably safer in some ways if you look at the statistics than people might believe, which is pretty remarkable and interesting. But I mean dangerous from the perspective of the questions you might get from a four-year-old. My four-year-old traveled to the U.S.-Mexico border with me, and we were standing about three feet away from a fence dividing Mexico from the U.S. on the American side, and he was just phenomenally puzzled by, by, by this thing. He, he said, well, what does that mean? And I tried my best uh, explanation for my four-year-old about what borders represent and about national sovereignty. And he looked down and he cocked his head and he said, I don't get it. So then I tried again. And then he said, uh, so you're telling me uh, one country has power here and the other country has power over there. And I was beginning to nod my head and to say yes when I stopped myself. And I thought, uh-oh, here's the law professor and me coming out. And I started thinking about tens of thousands of American service members abroad. I started thinking about American agents uh, investigating crimes abroad. I started thinking also, to some degree, about the power of the ideas of the Constitution, the US Constitution, and the transformative effect they can have in political discussions abroad. So before I knew it, I was trying to explain to him things that made him exceedingly boring. Uh, uh, bored, not boring. He's never boring. And he ran off, and I was talking to myself. I'm now very glad to be talking to you. I do want to note that when we think about this question of, does the Constitution apply abroad, there are two senses in which surely the answer has to be yes. Number one, to come back to a point that I alluded to before, if we ask ourselves, do the ideals that are reflected in the Constitution, religious liberty, the notion of a government with limited powers, but powers enough to address the concerns that the public has, protections against overweening government authority, do those ideas resonate abroad? Surely the answer is yes, those ideas are relevant to people around the world, and their own responses to those ideas give us a sense that in that sense, the Constitution applies abroad in some way. Second, does the Constitution apply abroad? Well, if uh, the President of the United States is on Air Force One, leaves American territory, and picks up that nice fancy phone in Air Force One and calls back to the White House and says, do this, do that, the answer from his staff or her staff will probably not be, well, Mr. President, the Constitution doesn't apply abroad, so you are nobody and we're not going to pay attention to you. But what does it really mean to say that the Constitution applies abroad? Or what about the Constitution applies abroad? That actually can be a very tough question. In cases like Alvarez Machine and Verdugo Orquides, I would argue hardly settle that question. Fortunately, I don't have to settle that question. Instead, we have, uh, to better address this, an amazing team of what I would call legal scholar superheroes. And I would note that for some of you that phrase is redundant, but I would beg to differ. <laughs> Uh, we can make distinctions there. And, uh, and who better ad address these issues than these particular legal scholar superheroes? So I'm going to start by introducing uh, the first gentleman who will present. And uh, then after he concludes, after about a 10 to 12 minute presentation, I will introduce the next person, and then the next person, and then the next person. And then if uh, need be, I will jump in with a sharp, penetrating, intense, dramatically brilliant question. And then I'll open it up uh, for your questions, which I'm sure will be a lot smarter than mine. So with that, let me turn it over to David Golov. And uh, all I will say about David, you have his bio, and it's very impressive. He's a professor at NYU, in fact, the Hiller Family Foundation Professor of Law. He secured a reputation as one of the most original scholars in constitutional law. His research includes constitutional law, international law, legal history, and he has all kinds of really cool degrees. He clerked for Marilyn Hall Patel. He is also a passionate Wild mushroom hunter. David. I'm going to talk about wild mushrooms today. Um, oh, maybe not. So um, 
I'm, I want to begin by making uh, three, or making three propositions, uh, two of which are sort of bold normative propositions and then one other uh, of a historical kind. And then I'm going to uh, be talking about history after that. The first uh, uh, proposition is, and again, I'm, this is really more of an assertion than anything else, but I, I, it's my view that any plausible moral theory has to recognize that the state is obligated to respect the fundamental rights of persons who are not citizens and live outside the territory of the state. And any moral theory which denies that would be a deficient theory. Second, um, I think uh, an attractive uh, a normative account of a constitution would also include uh, that uh, the, the, the idea that the constitution itself would recognize that there are limits of a constitutional nature on the way the state treats non-citizens outside of the territory or extraterritorially. Um, now, with those two propositions as a starting point, uh, the historical point is that I think it's fair to say that in the first 150 years of American history, American constitutional history until, say, World War II, there are virtually no precedents and no authorities uh, for the view uh, that uh, the Constitution does extend individual rights protections to the Bill of Rights uh, to non-citizens outside of United States territory. Now, um, that might give rise to the immediate impression that uh, I, I, I think that history would not support today such an interpretation of the Constitution. But on the contrary, uh, I, I'm going to try to suggest exactly the opposite of that today. I'm going to suggest that when we properly understand that history, uh, we'll see that in fact, uh, the, from its the extent that history is relevant in constitutional interpretation to us today, uh, this history strongly uh, argues in favor of extending rights of this kind. Okay. Um, now, to understand that historical point, we need to try to recover uh, the very different uh, jurisprudential world uh, of the founding and the very different uh, philosophical viewpoints that they, that they held at that time and through much of the first 150 years of American history. Um, now, before I begin trying to do that, um, uh, I want to just make one preliminary point, which is really uh, what Tino was alluding to, I think, which is the very the, the great ambiguity about what we mean when we say, does the Constitution apply extraterritorially? Um, and I think Alan, um, and Alan uh, has done some important work in trying to show how complicated and multifaceted uh, this problem might, may be. And I'm not going to try to solve much of that right now, but I do want to just, I think, affirm what I think uh, Tino was implying, which is it, I don't think on any plausible view the Constitution is not, doesn't apply extraterritorially. Surely the president is still the president. Surely Congress can't appoint a new commander in chief when the armed forces are acting, uh, that's not the president, when they're acting outside the country. Surely the president can't make a treaty just because he goes to uh, Versailles to negotiate it and so on. And the same applies to Congress's powers and so on. So it's not a question of whether or not the Constitution applies extraterritorially. What we're really asking about is whether the Bill of Rights uh, applies extraterritorially to non-citizens. And not only the Bill of Rights, but other rights protecting, individual rights protecting provisions of the Constitution. And that's the question that I'm, um, I'm devoting my remarks to. Um, OK. So um, uh, to, to try to recover the jurisprudential worldviews uh, of, the, of the earlier generations of Americans, starting with the founding, I want to try to I'll, I'll introduce three propositions, that are three basic ideas. The first one um, is to suggest that we need to understand better uh, the, the profound entanglement between uh, constitutional law and the law of nations at the time of the founding and throughout much of American history. Um, and in order to do that, we also have to have a better understanding of the normative uh, status of the law of nations uh, in the founding um, um, conception. Um, the law of nations and uh, the Bill of Rights were two different types of, or two different aspects of the public law. Um, they were both understood to, to, uh, to uh, incorporate fundamental uh, uh, rights and fundamental norm, uh, moral principles. They both were morally urgent. Um, uh, and they, maybe most importantly, they were both premised on enlightenment ideals of a similar kind, on enlightenment ideals and principles. Now, it's true that 
the Law of Nations and, uh, and the Bill of Rights applied to very different subjects and in very different contexts. And the rules and principles to which those different contexts and subjects gave rise made the rules of the Law of Nations or the rights that it respected or that it did demanded respect for quite different from uh, those that were in, enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Um, but the differences were not uh, of a moral status. Uh, they were uh, differences that derived from different contexts. Okay, so that's, that's the first point I want to make. Um, the second uh, point uh, that I think is uh, crucial to understand is something uh, what I've, I've called the, the fundamental public law framework that was adhered to at the time of the founding and again through much of American constitutional history. Now, on, on this approach, what I've called the, fund the public law framework, the state is understood to exercise two kinds of jurisdiction. Uh, on the, there's the municipal jurisdiction, sometimes referred to as the sovereign jurisdiction of the state. Um, uh, and then there is the jurisdiction under the law of nations, or sometimes referred to uh, as national jurisdiction, or in the context of war, belligerent jurisdiction, or belligerent, uh, uh, well, belligerent jurisdiction. Now, the key point is that in this conception, when the state exercises uh, its authority under its municipal jurisdiction, uh, the state is, is strictly bound to observe its municipal law, which includes the Constitution and, in particular, the Bill of Rights. Um, and, of course, that describes most of what we would think of as domestic governance. Um, and it's the kind of jurisdiction we're familiar with today. When the state exercises jurisdiction under the law of nations, which included the law of war and was exercised in a variety of contexts, but most obviously and, and, and perhaps importantly in the context of the prosecution of war, it was not bound by the municipal law. The law of nations was understood to supersede the municipal law, including the Bill of Rights. But the state had to act in accordance with the principles and constraints of the law of nations. Okay. Now, um, okay. Um, now, uh, let, let me now turn to a third proposition. Um, or before I do that, let me let me ex uh, to draw out one of what I think is the important implications of this framework. Um, uh, this, this historical approach. Uh, uh, can't, can't be fully captured by the accounts uh, that have been offered in, uh, in contemporary scholarship for different ways of, different kinds of approaches to the problem of extraterritorial application of the Bill of Rights. Um, actually, uh, Shemin has done some of the most interesting work uh, in recent scholarship proposing different ways of thinking about this problem or different approaches or models uh, for the problem. Um, the, the, the public law framework that I've described isn't strictly based on territoriality, um, nor is it strictly based on citizenship or membership. And it does not, therefore, correspond to the kind, the two of the models that um, um, Shaman proposes. One she calls the country model, I think, which is the, uh, would be strict territoriality. That is, the Constitution only applies within the territory of the United States, or the Bill of Rights only applies within the territory of the United States and not outside of the territory. Nor is it, as I say, captured by the membership or uh, compact uh, model, uh, which would be based on citizenship. Because uh, sometimes um, uh, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply inside the United States. It sometimes doesn't apply in, inside the United States, even in respect of citizens. Sometimes the Constitution of the Bill of Rights applies outside of the United States. Sometimes it applies outside of the United States to US citizens. Sometimes it applies, it doesn't apply, or in fact, most of the time it doesn't apply out of the United States. Um, uh, uh, and it doesn't apply even to citizens outside the United States. Now, I think that the, the third model that Shemin uh, uh, discusses is the, what she calls the conscience model. It's more of an uh, interpretation of the Bill of Rights along universalist lines. Um, and I think that's probably the right model for understanding the historical uh, 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 constitution that I'm trying to describe. But it's a very peculiar version of a, of a, uh, a, a conscience model. It's, it, the idea is that, uh, that uh, the Bill of Rights applies uh, when the municipal authority is being exercised, the law of nations applies when law of nations jurisdiction is, uh, is being exercised. 
Um, and this is not the result of a compromise of moral principle, but rather based on the view that the appropriate body of law, of public law, to govern a certain subject in a certain context is either the municipal law, including the Bill of Rights, or it's the law of nations along with the restrictions that the law of nations imposes. Um, so it's a conscience model in the sense that it's not an effort at a, at a compromise uh, 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 approach or approach which denies the importance of moral uh, uh, behavior outside of the United States in respect of non-citizens, for example, but it's that this is it, that the law of nations provides the appropriate um, set of legal and moral principles. Okay. Now, uh, without being able to get into this point in any great depth, I think it's very difficult to understand large chunks of American constitutional history without understanding how this model operated. Now, the most obvious and glaring, I suppose, example is the Civil War. I don't think it's possible to understand the constitutional theory of the Civil War unless one appreciates the way in which this model uh, was, uh, was embraced. Um, the, no one, uh, the, South, the, the Confederacy, the territory of the Confederacy was enemy territory, and no citizen, of course, it's a war on American territory against American citizens, and yet no American citizens residing in the South in enemy territory could invoke constitutional rights of any kind under the Bill of Rights. On the other hand, the government fully recognized that it was constitutionally obligated to apply the law of war, not only the powers that are granted by the law of war, but the limits which the law of war imposes on the state. Okay, now um, let me uh, introduce that one third idea very briefly, which is uh, the idea of uh, limited powers. Um, and limited powers uh, on the one hand and the Bill of Rights as different strategies uh, for protecting individual rights. Uh, the idea of, uh, of limited powers was that the grants of powers in the Constitution, the municipal powers as well as the uh, law of nations powers, were, um, had their own internal limits that were based on the subject matter scope of the power itself. Now, um, this is an uh, intuitive idea with respect to, say, the commerce power. With respect to the powers which I would call law of nations jurisdiction, uh, uh, the foreign affairs powers, if you want, the war and foreign affairs powers, um, the limited, this is where the, the, the limited powers doctrine in this context was a, made implicit reference to the law of nations as providing the source of limitations on the scope of the powers. That is, these powers were themselves uh, and they invoked the concepts of the law of nations, power, the power to declare war, uh, the power to make rules for captures, the power to find and punish offenses against the law of nations, the commander-in-chief power, treaties, uh, and so on. These were all uh, deliberate uh, references to law of nations categories and concepts, and they were themselves understood to be, the, both the scope of the power and the limits on the power were understood to be uh, uh, derived from uh, the principles of the law of nations. Okay, now um, uh, I would th this this I this approach has been in a long process of decline. I think since probably the end of the 19th century. Uh, in the beginning, uh, at that time, uh, the there was the beginning of the transformation in the status of international law and American constitutional jurisprudence. Um, that may have been brought about in part by the development of positivism, um, uh, perhaps by the emergence of the United States as a great power uh, on the international stage. Perhaps it was also, a, a contrary wise, a recognition that international law no longer provided sufficient protections for, for, um, uh, for uh, certain kinds of uh, rights. So for example, the extension of constitutional rights to non-citizens, aliens, resident aliens in the United States happens during this time. I think in part out of a recognition that international law no longer uh, it was adequate to the task. Um, in any event, um, uh, this uh, process of decline was greatly enhanced uh, during the New Deal revolution when the idea of internal limits of, of limited powers, uh, which had been such a central idea of the prior constitutional regime up till that time, um, uh, was, it, was, was undermined, uh, was rejected. Uh, internal limits or uh, subject matter scope limits on, on powers no longer uh, were at least in, in, in significant retreat, if not in disrepute. And instead of seeing the, the Bill of Rights as supplementary in the protection of individual rights to limited powers concepts, the 
the, uh, the Bill of Rights became the exclusive fount of, of limits on the powers of the state. Um, and to the point today when we think about whether there are limits on the powers of the state, we almost uh, reflexively think of, uh, of, the, of the Bill of Rights. Now, in light of this, it's not surprising that the first time we see the introduction of the idea and the arguments for applying the Bill of Rights extraterritorially comes in the wake of World War II. Uh, albeit mostly in dissenting opinions, uh, uh, which uh, remain a theme in court's jurisprudence until the Boumediene decision of just a couple of years ago when finally the court actually in the majority opinion adopts extraterritoriality. When it does so, uh, it does so, uh, one other point I'm gonna make uh, before, I, I, before I conclude, is it also happens in the same period that the Bill of Rights and Caroline products, footnote four, and so on, takes this central role, it also becomes, the interpretation of the Bill of Rights becomes much more expansive. Um, uh, uh, and, and their scope becomes much more extended. And that also corresponds with a development of balancing tests, proportionality type analysis, so that rather than having uh, bright line rules associated with the Bill of Rights, we have these much more open-ended balancing approaches, which makes it possible to apply the Bill of Rights to virtually any situation, including to perhaps uh, problems at the international level. Okay. Um, and that's what we see in this line of authority in the Supreme Court in the Boumediene decision. So the concluding point is uh, that I think it's fair to say that the American constitutional history has always had a constitution of conscience in Chemin Sens. Um, the basic contours of that constitution are really uh, no longer, they're archaic in a sense today. They're no longer well understood or appreciated. It's peculiar from our current point of view. But it is, in fact, uh, that, that was what the Constitution was uh, designed to accomplish. And in that sense, that history supports uh, today the possibility of extending the Bill of Rights extraterritorially as a way of, um, of rebalancing the Constitution uh, to achieve that aim. Thank you very much, David. That'll make for some interesting questions. Alan Erbson, sitting right next to me, is Associate Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota. He is a graduate of Harvard Squared. He uh, clerked for Judge Judith Rogers on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and spent six years in private practice at Meyer Brown and some additional time at Wilmer Hale or, or Wilmer Cutler and Pickering as it was known then. He has, among other interesting things, represented athletes at the Athens Olympics. So eminently qualified to chat about the subject. Welcome. Thanks. So the question for our panel is, does the Constitution apply abroad? And there's a general consensus that this is a difficult question, otherwise we wouldn't be here discussing it. I'm interested in why the question is difficult and how we should think about it. And my hope is that if we can understand the nature of the problem, then we're in a better position to formulate solutions or at least better ways of thinking about it. Now, there's many possible explanations for why the Constitution's geographic scope has proven so inscrutable. And we can come at this from a historical perspective, from various theoretical and normative perspectives. I want to focus on four explanations for why the problem is difficult, just from my own uh, perspective that tends to focus a little bit more on text. I don't think the first two explanations are especially unsettling, but those two help frame two additional explanations that I think are often overlooked and might provide some useful insights. These explanations posit that we need to think about the Constitution as transient. Its spatial reach shifts from time to time and from context to context. And analyzing these transient effects forces us to think about the content of law and the scope of law as interdependent. So on this view, geography isn't an isolated factor affecting constitutional interpretation. Instead, we need to integrate territorial considerations into a broader inquiry about the meaning of particular constitutional provisions. So on this view, it's not possible to state a grand theory of the Constitution's extraterritorial scope, but we can say something meaningful about individual provisions. So with that summary in mind, let's turn to the four explanations. So the first reason why thinking, uh, is that thinking about extraterritoriality requires injecting an extra variable into an interpretive calculus that's already complicated. So typical constitutional law problems uh, focus on questions such as who, what, when, and which. So we ask who acted, who did they act upon, who authorized it? We ask what was done, what was the effect, what's the potential remedy? which institutions have an interest in the outcome and which institutions have a role to play, and when did the relevant actions occur. Analyzing problems just limited to these variables is hard enough. It certainly keeps the Supreme Court busy. 
Uh, if we add a new set of variables linked to geography, it ratchets up the level of complexity. So now we have to ask, where did conduct occur? Where were effects experienced? Where uh, did the relevant actors have affiliations? So we have more factors to consider and then more permutations of these variables to analyze, so the interpretive enterprise is more difficult. So if we introduce this where variable into the equation, we run into a second problem. That variable doesn't have consistent significance because the constitution does not have a fixed or uniform scope. There's no single on-off switch that's triggered by crossing borders. Sometimes the constitution applies extraterritorially, sometimes it doesn't. I can illustrate this with some hypos. David and Tino uh, anticipated the first one, so just imagine that the president is, London, is in London visiting the prime minister while he's in 10 Downing Street. A conflict erupts in Iraq, and the president is forced to communicate directly with the military commanders in the theater. Surely they have to follow his orders. He doesn't cease to be commander-in-chief based on his location. Indeed, one can imagine that the president is constitutionally entitled to lead troops on foreign fields of battle if he wanted to. Uh, similarly, the president's location doesn't immunize him from otherwise extant constraints on his office. So, for example, Article 2 forbids the president from accepting emoluments from states. So if we hypothesize that the governor of California is traveling in the president's delegation and on the spur of the moment chooses to provide some emolument pursuant to some inherent authority of his office, the president can't say, I'm in London, the normal rules uh, don't apply, I'll pocket the emolument. I don't think these hypos present particularly difficult questions, as Tino and David both noted. The president's authority or lack of authority is clear in each. But what's interesting is these hypos suggest that the Constitution is in some respects blind to borders. And we'll come back to why that's interesting in a second. So there's some obligations and powers that transcend physical space. Contrast that with a harder hypo. While the president is in London with his entourage, the Secret, Ser Secret Service detail searches a foreign citizen who's attending the president's speech and finds evidence of a terrorist plot that then leads to prosecution in a US court. Assume that if the search had been conducted in Washington, DC, for various reasons, it would not have survived Fourth Amendment scrutiny and the evidence would be excluded. The question is, does the fact that the search was conducted in London mean that the evidence is now uh, admissible? The answer is probably no in light of the Supreme Court's controversial decision uh, in Verdugo uh, Aquinez. Uh, but if we think about the fact pattern on a clean slate, we can see that it presents at least two difficult questions. First, we have to think about whether the Fourth Amendment applies at all, since the action occurred abroad and the uh, subject of the search was an alien. And then we have to ask, if the Fourth Amendment applies, does it apply differently? So does the word reasonable in the Fourth Amendment have a different meaning when the search is conducted in London as opposed to Washington, DC? So the difficulty of these questions in comparison to the questions that arise in the first two hypos about the president highlights how geography can be dispositive in certain circumstances, even if it's not always dispositive. So once we recognize that geography sometimes matters and it sometimes doesn't, we have to be able to draw lines that distinguish the context in which it matters from the context in which it does not. So the question is, how do we draw those lines? And that leads to a third problem. And that problem is that the Constitution's scope is transient. So consider, again, two examples. First, Article I allows Congress to regulate piracy on the high seas. So imagine Congress enacts a statute enforcing this power. The courts are obligated to apply that statute. Why? Because the Supremacy Clause tells them to. But we wouldn't say that the Constitution is therefore the supreme law of the Gulf of Aden. Rather, the Constitution applies in a narrow slice of the Gulf where piracy is occurring for a limited time and in a limited context. Similarly, Article I empowers Congress to regulate the armed forces, and Congress has done that in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and that applies worldwide. Literally, the statute says it applies in, quote, any place. Uh, and so, if a soldier uh, is on patrol outside of Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan and commits some sort of uh, illegal act, he can be court-martialed for it. Yet, we wouldn't say that the Constitution is the supreme law of Afghanistan. Likewise, we wouldn't say that statutes enacted pursuant to the Constitution are the supreme law of Afghanistan. Rather, the Constitution transits through Afghanistan along with that patrol. So these hypos tell us that even if the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, the land that it covers shifts over time. And even when the Constitution uh, applies, it's not really supreme except in a narrow sense. It's the supreme law of the places where it applies to the extent that it applies for the duration of its application. But how do we know the extent and duration of the Constitution's application? The Supremacy Clause doesn't really give us criteria. It doesn't tell us where the Constitution can wander. It doesn't tell us how long it lingers. And it doesn't tell us the significance of its presence, which is one of the reasons why this degree is so difficult.
So we have to define limits on a transitory constitution. Well, how do we do that? That leads to a fourth problem. The scope of the law and the content of the law must be interdependent. We often can't say anything meaningful about where a constitutional provision applies unless we know something about the purpose of that provision and how it goes about achieving that purpose. So we can't conceptualize geography as an exogenous constraint on constitutional meaning, that we have a constitutional provision, we have geography, and we take the constitutional provision as some integrated whole, and then we apply geography to it, and we think about territoriality. Rather, you have to think about what the Constitution means in light of multiple variables of which geography is just one. The nature of the spatial constraint is enmeshed in the meaning of the clause. And to see why, let's loop back to the hypos uh, that I started with. So we know that the president is commander in chief while he's in London. How do we know that? Well, we look at the law for guidance about the significance of the land where it applies. So we ask questions such as, what purpose does the commander in chief clause serve? Why is it in the Constitution? And presumably the purpose is it's necessary to allocate power among the different branches of government and to structure the exercise of military authority. So we then ask, is there any reason why one would think that territory and geography limit the exercise of that power? And there really isn't. There certainly are limits on the commander in chief power. So for example, Congress has authority under Article I to regulate the armed forces. The 25th Amendment would allow removal of the commander in chief uh, in case he becomes inc incapacitated. So there are limits. And so we can engage in a sort of structural analysis to figure out what those limits are. But none of those limits really uh, provide a role for geography. Well, we can ask the same kinds of questions when we're thinking about the Fourth Amendment in the Secret Service hypo that I gave before. So we would ask, what purpose does the Fourth Amendment serve? And there's obviously many different kinds of answers that you could give to that question. So you might say, the Fourth Amendment exists because it cars out a zone of privacy for a particular class of people. And if that's what the Fourth Amendment is for, then territory might very well matter. Because we have to think, how far does that zone extend? Where is it? Who is allowed to occupy that zone? What kinds of people fall within it? And so then you'd really want to know who's being searched, where are they being searched? On the other hand, you might look at the Fourth Amendment and say to yourself, the amendment is there because it says that executive officials simply aren't allowed to do certain kinds of things. We think it's important to cabin executive discretion, to cabin the discretion of federal agents. There's some stuff they just can't do. And if you think that's why the amendment's there, then the bar raises a little bit higher to make an argument that geography somehow affects the interpretation of that amendment uh, when searches are exercised by federal officials abroad, because the amendment uh, on this hypothesis uh, would be limiting the discretion of federal officials, and they're still federal officials even when they're in London. Likewise, you could look at the amendment and say to yourself, well, this is partially limiting, partially providing privacy, it's partially limiting executive actors, but one of the things it's doing is limiting the authority of US courts to consider certain kinds of evidence depending on the provenance of that evidence. And if that's what the amendment's doing, then we probably or might not care about the geographic origin of that evidence. So there's many different ways of thinking about what the Fourth Amendment does. Territory is relevant from some of those perspectives and not relevant from others. The point is, thinking about geography in isolation doesn't tell us anything interesting about the Fourth Amendment's scope. Just knowing where the search occurred doesn't tell us something unless we already have a theory about what the Fourth Amendment does, and it's that theory about what the Fourth Amendment does that is ultimately going to help us answer the question of how far it applies. Just like it's our theory of why the Commander-in-Chief Clause is in the Constitution that's going to tell us something interesting about whether the President's Commander-in-Chief power is in any way limited by where he happens to be at a particular time, or whether the President can grant emoluments in one place but not in others. So this sort of context-sensitive inquiry into the meaning of many discrete clauses, so rather than looking at the Bill of Rights as a whole, we have to fragment it, look at each individual amendment and each of the several clauses that are in some of those amendments, makes answering the question of how does the Constitution apply abroad very difficult. But if we recognize the necessity of that kind of granular inquiry, I think it helps us in thinking about the problem that the panel's trying to address. A grand theory of extraterritoriality won't exist, Rather, we'll be able to take some of the concepts, uh, for example, some of the ideas uh, that David discussed about how to think about 
um, the extent to which a country is obligated to respect the strictures of its organic document in different contexts, and apply them not to the Constitution, but apply them to this sentence of the Constitution and that sentence of the Constitution and some other sentence of the Constitution, and ultimately conclude that the Constitution is transient, that the meaning of particular provisions is, inter the, the, the content of particular rules and the scope of those rules are interdependent, and that we might reach different answers uh, depending on the kinds of questions that we're asking. So I'll end on that point, and I'm happy to elaborate uh, in the Q&A. Thank you, Alan. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Bush. Jonathan is a scholar who's focused his interest on international and criminal law in the American and British legal context. He's focused on war crimes and trials in and after World War II and elsewhere, the legal treatment of medieval and Renaissance Jews, and the origins of slavery in North America. But he's just uh, as much at home in the world of legal practice because before he started teaching, he worked as a trial lawyer with the US Department of Justice where he helped to prosecute Nazi war criminals. He's currently writing a biography that clearly reflects a good number of these interests uh, on Telford Taylor, which I'm quite uh, intrigued by and uh, looking forward to reading, who of course was the chief prosecutor in the Nuremberg trials. Welcome, uh, Jonathan. I should note that his brother-in-law is doing an opera here at Stanford in January. Uh, the name is David Lang, and uh, Jonathan thinks that you shouldn't miss it. Thank you, Tino, for the gracious introduction and for the useful plug for David, who needs no plugs. Um, thank you also to Michael McConnell for organizing this and for Nathan Chapman for doing um, all the other work associated with it. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, we've heard a number of papers, both now and earlier in the conference, uh, stimulating papers taking broad and ambitious uh, offerings, theoretical possibilities for us. I'd like to do it the reverse. I'd like to uh, go from the ground up, the view from the trenches, talking about three little cases, um, one of which I was peripherally involved with, one of which happened long before I was born, and all uh, two of which I've talked to prosecutors and defense lawyers from the case in preparation for today, the judges uh, long being deceased. Um, I do, one is from the 1980s, and it's from the, an early war on terror case, one is from the 1970s, it's an early uh, drug war case, and one is from the late 1940s, a uh, major war crimes case. Um, I raised these three cases from the ground up, as it were, uh, out of, in addition to my own interests and inclinations, uh, also because it, you have the feeling that sometimes I'd like a little more data points between, between the post 9-11 cases that we all talk about, and I think all of us on the panel um, are ready for the ob obligatory question on Anwar al awlaki but hope not to spend an hour on it, um, and the founding period that we've heard so many good papers about. There's, you know, there's a lot of history in between. Maybe we can talk about a little bit of it. Um, finally, I'm doing at least the third example that I'd like to talk about in uh, a tribute that I've won long wanted to pay to a great uh, Stanford legal historian, legal scholar, Charles Fairman. Um, that great scholar is uh, long deceased, of course, um, is best remembered today for being sort of the uh, uh, the historian who supplied the work for uh, Felix Frankfurter's position against Hugo Black on, on issues of reconstruction, uh, the reconstruction amendments. But before that, he was a historian of the law of war, a military historian, uh, and he wrote a fabulous article in the first issue of the Stanford Law Review, uh, which informs much of what I'll talk about in my third example, though I hope to add a few little tidbits that, uh, that the great man didn't know. First case, Fawaz Yunus often called the first uh, overseas snatch case, though of course it wasn't, and it's often called the first uh, uh, deliberation about the Fifth Amendment and Miranda abroad, though it wasn't quite that either. The facts are that uh, Yunus was a, um, a hijacker. He participated in the hijacking of a Royal Jordanian Air Force, uh, a Royal Jordanian uh, airplane, uh, which was uh, destroyed. He was um, living in Lebanon. He was lured with the promise of, of a great drug deal. Uh, with, uh, by FBI agents. Uh, he was met on the high seas. FBI agents had uh, very limited options of where they could operate from, and they, they met him on the high seas, uh, brought him back in a boat for four days, transferred to a, uh, um, en route to a larger boat, and then to a plane which took him to Andrews Air Force Base. And there he lands in the office of a USA, uh, of an assistant U.S. attorney. Um, the Justice Department clearly wanted to prosecute him for a number of reasons. One because he was a terrorist. Second, because it was soon after the passage of both a long-arm statute criminalizing hijacking, even though it wasn't an American flagship um, uh, plane, and the passage of SEPA, the Classified Information Protect uh, Procedures Act. And so it was a great test case. 
and, and prosecutors knew that. Uh, he, was in, he was interrogated in the four days on the ship, uh, gave statements, uh, and so before Judge Barrington Parker, the question was, uh, is, this, is, this, is this outrageous, is this shocking? What about Miranda doesn't apply to Fawaz Yunus? Um, go back a second. In the world, in the prosecutor's offices, there are different arguments you can make, of course. You can say the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply abroad, or you can say this was the perfect interrogation, Your Honor. Um, I mean, there were a few problems with that, but he had been read his rights in Arabic. He had uh, been signed a rights card a couple of times. Um, he was um, hydrated, he was fed, um, and so on. But, you know, it can be spun a different way. Four days is a long time uh, before arraignment. Four days is a long time before an opportunity to see counsel. Uh, four days is a long time for someone from a different culture to be repeatedly um, uh, harassed with questions, asked questions. Uh, within the prosecution, they, they, again, as I say, they had the two ways to ask to challenge the objection. Both were made. Uh, the Judge Parker uh, excluded all statements that were made. Uh, he was reversed 3 nothing by the Court of Appeals and was reversed in the other objections uh, that he sustained uh, to SEPA and every, uh, to, the, to the SEPA issues. Um, the point of the case, clearly to me, is it's a complete accident that prosecutors chose to make both objections. They didn't just say, Your Honor, this, we don't have to give any rights here. They, they went through bringing in uh, interrogators and other uh, crewmen from the ship saying, let us tell you the conditions of his confinement. Well, that, that's a great way to rebut these objections. Um, both, you know, within them, even if Miranda applies, it's, it's been satisfied. Um, it's also an ironic case of, uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's like a benign terrorist. I mean, he made a point. At trial, his, his arguments were, we didn't single out the Americans. We intentionally treated everyone well and didn't kill anybody. Um, well, never mind, he was, given, he was given a long time and it's still there. Um, it's probably also the case that prosecutors sometimes overplay their hand, as I'll say in another, in my next example, but defense lawyer probably overplayed his hand here too by trying to emphasize the racial angle, um, repeatedly making arguments to the African-American jury in Washington that um, uh, you don't, uh, Shiites are oppressed, and he, he was a Lebanese Shiite, he's an oppressed minority, he's fighting the only way, fighting the man the only way he can. Um, Unfortunately, everyone in the, in the uh, case, including the prosecutor and the judge, were also African American, so there was, uh, it didn't have as much credibility as it might otherwise have had. Um, second case, Toscanino. Very well known uh, to those of us who do this because everyone remembers the Toscanino exception, which has never been applied in any single case. Um, the Toscanino case was a, he's a, an Italian drug smuggler uh, who was operating in Brazil and Uruguay, I believe it was Uruguay and was abducted and brought here. First thing, you know, first thing we know, he shows up in the office of an AUSA uh, in Brooklyn. Um, he claims he's been snatched. He claims he's been tortured for statements as well. Uh, and here's again the same, and, and, and these objections are made by his skilled defense counsel. They're pending before the court and the prosecution has these questions. What are we gonna do about this? What do we say? And the, two, the same two answers, the fourth and fifth don't apply abroad, or what do you mean? We, we complied with everything we're supposed to. And in this case, you had a, a prosecutor full of swagger. Uh, he's a well-known man. He's the prosecutor who also had had great luck in the French connection cases. And he figured something to the effect of the hell with it. We don't have to do this. These rules don't apply. And he walked right into it, appearing before the Second Circuit. Uh, Judge Mansfield writes, um, what do you mean the Constitution doesn't apply anywhere overseas? Um, and, and he crafted this so-called Toscanino exception that says, if there's behavior abroad by American agents that shocks the conscience, um, this court should be divested of, juris, uh, of, of jurisdiction over it, uh, over such a case. Um, remand to see if, if the behavior actually happened in this case. And it was tough to show because for, he may or may not have been tortured. He had no evidence, no, uh, he had been given a medical examination and he had made no statements. So in a way it's this funny posture of there's nothing to suppress. You might uh, quash jurisdiction, but you can't suppress statements. Uh, you know, not statements not made. In any event, Toscanino also went to prison. There's a, there's a number of uh, related cases from the, from the same circuit in the same period. But the bottom line, as the Eunice case said a few years ago, uh, a few years later, is that there doesn't ever appear to have been a case that met the so-called Toscanino exception. If there's a warning here, the kind of accident of the way litigants shape rights and bring them out for overseas cases, the example here was clearly a prosecutor with swagger should have been a little more sensitive to his colleagues in the office saying, oh, let, let's say, let's, you know, the Fourth Amendment snatch issue wasn't an issue. That was well covered in the law at the time and was affirmed later by the Supreme Court. But the so-called torture arguments should have been rebutted, could have been rebutted, and weren't by a prosecutor full of himself. Last case, uh, and this one I know differently entirely from archives, uh, 
as, the, as it must be. It's about Nuremberg. And I don't want to talk about the trial. You all know the, the first trial and the, uh, the next 12 that the Americans did in the same city in the same courthouse. The issue here is um, federal court review and what kind of rights apply there. The same question, in other words, as all these others. Um, in this case, I mean, go through it sequentially. The, the first trial, the IMT, as it's called, uh, ends in fall of, of 46. Uh, is it appealed to the Supreme Court? Are there any rights that are at issue, any American rights? Of course not. I mean, if ever a trial was truly multilateral, unless you want also being appealed to the Supreme Soviet uh, and so on, uh, it just, this truly was a multinational enterprise backed by a treaty. It's pretty fair and all the rest. Um, case number, uh, all right, next, move, move the clock on a little bit. It's 1946, 47. The law, let's say, in early 47 is what? I guess it's that truly international things don't seem, multinational institutions don't seem to appeal their proceedings to the Supreme Court. Um, and I don't know, there's Quirin that says eight nothing, um, that military tribunals, even in the US in time of war, convened by the president are pretty much have a free hand. And there's Yamashita 6-2 saying the same thing even though the war is ended and they're held overseas convened by the theater commander in that case, not by the president. Um, either way, 8 nothing 6 2 doesn't look very favorable for um, getting yourself to US federal courts. Um, the first of the 12 Nuremberg, of the, of the American run, 12 Nuremberg trials ends. Uh, trial of Erhard Milch. Uh, there's nothing really good written about him. There's an awful biography by David Irving, the Nazi denier, so you can take it with a grain of salt, but it's, it has good, it has some actual value to it, dare I say it. Um, uh, Milch is convicted, and he brings a weird habeas petition to the US Supreme Court. It's this bizarre subspecies of original habeas jurisdiction to the Supreme Court, which obviously doesn't apply in normal cases. Um, and the Supreme Court, thinking about it, has two votes in the same day, um, one by a vote of 4-4. It says, we're going to change the rules from now on for original habeas. We don't grant unless there's, unless there's a clear majority of sitting of current justices who are in favor of taking jurisdiction. And second, 4-4, we don't want to take this case. Um, so they don't look at Milch. And where my part of the story, the fun part, picks up is I found all sorts of neat correspondence among prosecutors and, and all the rest who are going nuts. I mean, in the gist of their objection is, let me get this straight. We've tried to craft procedurally excellent trials in which there is extensive criminal discovery of a sort that wasn't arrived at in our internal jurisdiction for many decades. We have you know, multiple counsel of choice for indigents. We have all sorts of great things. Uh, and we barely survive Supreme Court looking at us 4-4 while these kangaroo courts, which is how Nuremberg looked at Yamashita. You know, these were quickie drumhead courts. And there, you know, the Supreme Court has no problem or very little problem. How does that work? Um, and, and they get letters back. You know, the letters are neat and so, you know, someday I'll do something with them. But the letters back are um, to Taylor and um, Charles Fairman, who's one of the legal advisors in the, uh, in the American occupation government, saying, guys, you don't understand. The same people who don't like Nuremberg and Jackson also don't like big business. Um, so if you can sort of arrange it that maybe the next case to come up here before the court is Flick or Farben or, you know, Krupp, one of these industrialist cases you're prosecuting, that would be really great. And then, you know, the Supreme Court, by that kind of accident of who feels what way about what kind of cases, will make a very different ruling about extraterritorial uh, review and rights. Um, in the end, it didn't work out that way at all. The next case was, that was quickly finished was the medical uh, case. And, and, and again, it's, it's shot down, shot out of the Supreme Court 4-4, uh, you know, the Nazi doctor's case. Uh, and then the last step is only that, um, again, by complete act, by the way, they're all 4-4 and 8 because uh, Justice Jackson uh, quite rightly recused himself from all European theater war crimes cases. And so everything gets log jammed 4-4. Um, even though he was already back and you know, serving on the court for all other purposes. Um, by accident of when things end, the next case that comes is the Tokyo Tribunal. The Tokyo Tribunal is, the Tokyo Tribunal is different from Nuremberg. It's much more American run. Um, they give it a shot of coming to the Supreme Court and Jackson breaks the tie for the first time in effect saying, um, I, I, the only thing worse than me looking like I'm uh, approving my own programs is, is the US Supreme Court looking like we're afraid to endorse these major um, world theater cases, uh, and we're chicken. So I will, I, I kind of vote to, rev to accept jurisdiction, and having taken it, this, the US Supreme Court um, said in the Iraqi case, you know, that there's no problem with the Tokyo Tribunal. 
Um, I don't have to go through the rest part because there's no time, but the other, um, the rest of the story is, is covered by the great Charles Fairman, but how the Supreme Court from then through Eisentrager, why they rejected uh, oversight of almost all the cases um, so, you know, later until 1950-51. That's not important. What's important to me, I think, is this complete accident of, of why they took, why they didn't take, and, and, and you know, the accident that had, had it been Krupp instead of the doctors uh, that came up next, you might have seen a very different uh, law from this consistent turning down, uh, we won't look at it, it's overseas, whatever happens, uh, whatever happens in Nuremberg stays in Nuremberg, or, uh, or, and so on. Um, the, you know, so, so all these cases illustrate the same point, you know, kind of the accidents of litigation developing which rights apply where and when and how. Um, let me stop there. She's an expert in the fields of international law and international tribunals, international law and US courts, comparative law and complex litigation. Putting that to practice, she in 2005 served as co-counsel with the American Civil Liberties Union and Human Rights First, in the first civil lawsuit to challenge the government's treatment of detainees in Iraq and Afghanistan. She has degrees from Yale Law School, Oxford, and Harvard, was born in Canada, clerked for the Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, and has two adorable little children. Um, thanks very much, Tino, and I, I should add, of course, that um, the adorableness of my children is, is you know, almost matched by the adorableness of Tino's own two offspring. So I'm um, delighted to be here uh, with all of you. Thanks very much again for uh, including me in this discussion. And the perspective that I, uh, I would like to take is a more comparative perspective, uh, taking a step back uh, at the risk, maybe, uh, with apologies to Alan, uh, of, of gesturing towards grand theory, not um, in any sort of attempt to uh, argue that we can uh, automatically deduce from such grand theory the answer to obviously complex and contingent questions, but rather on a descriptive level to take note uh, of approaches that uh, other countries' courts have used to interpreting and applying their own domestic rights regimes. And so following in uh, Dan's footsteps from yesterday, uh, making a few comments about our um, wonderful backdrop here. Of course, there's no specification that it's the U.S. Constitution that we've been charged uh, with discussing, although I guess that's a, an assumption that we're all uh, uh, sort of sharing. And moreover, interestingly, right, we've got the preamble um, superimposed on the uh, world map, although uh, when we talk about uh, extraterritoriality, as, as David mentioned, I think we, we more often are thinking about uh, Bill of Rights uh, type provisions, in other words, provisions that uh, I think have a, a dual role, and, and as Alan says, m different provisions within the Bill of Rights may have different purposes, but overall I think there's, there's both an idea, right, and depending on your sort of orientation, you may emphasize one or the other of these ideas, but there's both the idea that we are constructing some limitations on the apparatus of government and at the same time uh, that we are creating, I guess you called, you know, you referred in particular in the Fourth Amendment to a zone of privacy, but so, some sort of zone of inviolability that inheres in the individual. Uh, and then when we talk about applying those provisions, right? Well, of course, the word applying, as uh, Tino pointed out in his introductory remarks, could have a more sort of abstract general uh, connotation in terms of, you know, resonating worldwide. But I'd like to focus in particular on uh, the application of rights uh, in a more uh, sort of pedantic, literal sense, uh, in the judicial enforceability of rights provisions. Uh, and so in that sense, while um, I certainly you know, um, agree with and, and appreciate and um, learned much from, from David's exposition of some of the history and the idea of sort of different public law regimes uh, operating but being sort of mutually complementary, I think that as a, a practical matter, um, whether or not one thinks this is appropriate, right, if we took a snapshot today uh, and our, our panel um, uh, yesterday, the first panel, I think, certainly highlighted this. If we took a snapshot today, right, it's very difficult to go into uh, a U.S. court uh, and enforce uh, as an individual uh, the international public law regime that while it may well uh, apply or constrain the actions of the U.S. government, uh, it is not something that a U.S. judge by and large uh, will be able to or willing to uh, do much about in terms of actually constraining 
uh, the political branches and particularly the executive branch, whereas in certain instances, right, uh, you may have, an individual might have uh, a judicially enforceable individual right under the US uh, Constitution and it's precisely that act of judicial review, right, that, that stands at the heart of what we believe to be uh, the kind of, um, you know, the particular pride that I think that the U.S. system takes in uh, its ability to guarantee certain individual rights. And so then the question does become uh, where and to whom, right? Uh, and um, as David uh, kindly mentioned, uh, I've looked at this question, again, it's sort of as a descriptive matter, at least in the first instance, uh, not only in terms of the uh, application or interpretation of, of US constitutional provisions overseas, um, but also to how, uh, in particular, Canadian courts and UK courts have interpreted and applied their own respective domestic rights regimes. Because again, if we think about uh, this morning's conversation about territorial sovereignty and um, and sort of the limits on sovereignty uh, or the, the you know, potential threat of international bodies to territorial sovereignty. Uh, there, there seems to be underlying that discussion some notion maybe that there are, are certain uh, powers or limitations uh, inherent in the idea of territorial sovereignty itself. And I think what a comparative perspective shows us is that uh, much less is actually inherent, much more is contingent. Uh, this is probably a, a theme that, that resonates with the presentation that, that Jonathan just made. Uh, in fact, you know, our notion, right, when I say our, I'll say you know, the American notion that uh, that membership matters, right, is surprisingly, and I say surprisingly because I was surprised to discover this, surprisingly, um, I would almost go so far as to say unique to the American system, the American constitutional system. And, and so I'll, let me, I'll say a little bit um, more about that in, in the few minutes that I have, and then we'll certainly be happy to elaborate in questions. So um, as again, as, as David was generous enough to introduce, I've used this sort of convenient framework for, for organizing my own thoughts on different approaches to, again, generally speaking, whether or not uh, a particular domestic rights regime might constrain the actions of government when the government acts overseas in a, and constrain in a, in a sort of robust way, in a judicially enforceable way. And I, I've categorized these, again, with, with uh, full acknowledgement that there's overlap around the edges and, and no typology is perfect, um, as falling under the rubrics of country, compact, and conscience. And although the country model, that is a sort of strict territorial model, might seem somewhat of a caricature, uh, we do encounter this. Again, certainly not with respect to the structural provisions of the Constitution. We don't think that the president loses his authority when he gets on a plane. But, um, but for example, some you know fairly recently, within the last few years in Canada, uh, in this uh, Regina versus Hape decision, a very strict notion of uh, essentially you know different parts of the world are governed by different. Uh, municipal law regimes, and the Canadian municipal law regime, of which the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a part, applies on Canadian territory uh, and doesn't apply outside of Canadian territory. So this is not actually that sort of archaic or um, unthinkable a notion. Um, now that is complicated by, uh, in this particular Canadian framework, a greater willingness to uh, look to international rights and the way in which international law may constrain government action. So there's no, uh, there's not necessarily a vacuum left by that territorial restriction. But interestingly, right, um, that territorial restriction has has been affirmed in recent Canadian jurisprudence. This compact model that that's been talked about, uh, and and Jonathan mentioned. Uh, the Verdugo case really is epitomized by Chief Justice Rehnquist's uh, opinion in uh, Verdugo or Quitas, in which he talks about you know, the rights of the people, right? And, and this is something I think that is a very resonant trope in uh, American constitutional jurisprudence for a variety of uh, I, you know, largely historical reasons. Uh, and it's one that um, has appeared recently right on the front page of the New York Times when uh, and, you know, John warned us that we might get into targeted killing. But you know, let's just think for a minute, why is it uh, that we um, became so interested as a nation in the targeted killing program when a U.S. citizen uh, was at the receiving end, of course, of government action, whereas, although uh, certainly there hadn't been no interest, there had been much less interest when citizens of other countries were at the receiving end of that program, and so, uh, or of that coercive action. Um, so it's an interesting, again, it may seem intuitive, 
you know, of course, of course we're going to be more worried when it's a U.S. citizen. Um, but I would pose the question why, and I would suggest that other countries might not be so quick, at least in jurisprudential terms, to think that there is necessarily a difference from a domestic rights perspective or a domestic constraints perspective between extraterritorial coercive action by the government that affects citizens or non-citizens. Uh, and, and a perfect example of that is the Smith case decided by uh, the UK Supreme Court not too long ago, uh, in which the court very much rejected this notion that a member of the UK Armed Services uh, act overseas was entitled to any more, or I should add any less, right, but any more or less protection than, you know, a villager in one of the uh, areas that, that he, in this case it was a he, was sent to patrol, right? So this distinction along membership lines is, I think, very intuitive uh, to an American audience, but I, I thought it might be interesting for you to learn uh, that it's actually not necessarily uh, intuitive, even to our, our fairly close uh, neighbors, namely the, the UK and, and Canada. Uh, close in, well, in one sense, in geographic terms, in the other sense, in, in jurisprudential terms, right? Uh, and then, as David mentioned, this sort of conscience idea is, 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 um, captures more the notion that whether a government acts outside its borders or within its territorial borders should not matter from the perspective of the, the judicially enforceable constraints uh, upon that action, uh, I guess more analogous to the notion that the president being on a plane you know, overseas or not should not affect uh, the scope of his powers. And one can get there, uh, as David mentions, uh, through a number of different types of reasoning, either a focus on sort of the limited nature of government, the idea of the Constitution as a document that actually constitutes government, and so as a government of enumerated powers, it can do what it can do, it can't do what it can't do. Um, or again, from this sort of notion of fundamental values, which I think is sort of the moral idea that, that David evoked at the very beginning of his remarks. Uh, and again, the, the sort of basic observation that I would put out there is that I think, uh, and I would certainly agree with David, that as, as a general matter, I think it's extremely important to recognize certain fundamental rights, fundamental values. And by and large, uh, the documents that most successfully capture uh, and recognize those are uh, actually international uh, human rights instruments. Uh, and then also, particularly in the case of Europe, right, European instruments. Uh, but what we're talking about here and what we've been charged to discuss in this conference is a different type of instrument, right? It's a domestic rights uh, granting instrument uh, in the United States, the Bill of Rights. And uh, that those instruments, those types of instruments uh, in this day and age are more readily judicially enforceable uh, than the international instruments. Uh, and so while uh, on the one hand, we may have in theory a certain complementarity uh, of you know, domestic rights extending to a certain point, international rights kind of picking up where domestic rights leave off. Uh, the problem is that you do then get uh, an enforcement gap because the international rights uh, generally uh, are not directly enforceable. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, right, uh, the irony is that on the one hand, uh, we have um, this view that United States citizens, for example, are entitled to greater protections vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. government than are un other individuals affected by extraterritorial government action. Uh, on the other hand, right, uh, those very same citizens would not be able to come into a U.S. court uh, and seek enforcement of their international rights. Uh, and, and this dovetails a little bit uh, with some of the conversations this morning about delegation of authority to international tribunals uh, and so forth. So the very final point I wanted to make uh, is just that an, another phenomenon that one sees, I think, in, in looking at these cases, uh, and I have an article called Rights Beyond Borders that, that goes through this jurisprudence in much more detail than, than 10 minutes or even you know, two hours would allow, uh, is that what we see, I think, a lot of the time uh, is a discussion about these issues involving extraterritorial application, external boundaries, uh, really being reflective of internal processes, of constituting internal boundaries, uh, notably between the judiciary uh, and the political branches, right? Because the ultimate question, again, from the perspective I'm bringing, uh, which is a comparative perspective, uh, and then also a separation of powers perspective, is you know when is a U.S. court actually going to step in and tell the political branches no, uh, you can't act or you must uh, provide a remedy for an action that that exceeded the scope of your lawful authority. Thank you very much, Simon. I'm going to ask two brief questions. To um, the first one is to David and Ellen.
it really doesn't do justice to all the arguments and ideas you have to say the following, but I do think that it captures one strand in your thinking, and that is that current doctrine with respect to the extraterritorial application of the Constitution is not about bright line rules. That might even be an understatement. It's about standards, and it can be about standards in a number of ways. First, that simple <coughs> GPS information doesn't settle the issue, but second, even if you add a bunch of information in the rules versus standards continuum, you might still have to do a lot of standards-oriented work. So given that back, and I should acknowledge that I sense a little bit that while both of you are doing interesting work in explaining why that is, you have maybe different views, subtly different views with respect to whether that's a good thing or not in the end. And you didn't really get into the normative stuff, but I, I sensed in Alan a little bit more of a sense of, look, this. Maybe this is not such a bad thing. Maybe this is, in fact, the only way to do this. But, but hold off on th that, and let me just ask you to react to the following statement I'm going to read you, which was written by a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Constitution is the source of Congress's authority to criminalize conduct, whether here or abroad, and of the executive's authority to investigate and prosecute such conduct. But the same Constitution also prescribes limits on our government's authority to investigate, prosecute, and punish criminal conduct whether foreign or domestic, period, full stop. This is Justice Brennan in Verdugo Orquídez, as you probably guessed. And my question is, if Justice Brennan were here, would you say, Justice Brennan, you are wrong with all respect because dot, 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 and what would you say? Or would you say, well, Justice, I might have written it slightly differently, but in the end, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, so le uh, let me uh, flip the two questions. Um, so, if we're thinking about rules versus standards, the, the, the Supreme Court could take a rule-based approach to the Fourth Amendment if it said, the Fourth Amendment either does or does not apply, period, depending on uh, whether the target of the search is an alien or a citizen. Or it could say, Fourth Amendment applies, but the word reasonableness is really, really fuzzy, and we're going to play around with it like an accordion, uh, depending on the circumstances of a case. And my sense is they've sort of moved towards the former, so it is a little bit more rules-based than it is standard-based, although Rodrigo Quiras is a difficult opinion uh, to interpret. Uh, so I'm not sure they've gone completely in the direction of standards. Uh, as to what I would say to Justice Brennan, uh, first, how did you get here? Uh, <laughs> second, um, no, I think it, one way of thinking, one move that you sometimes see in the literature on extraterritoriality is to try and relocate the decision making domestically. So you say, look, the FBI conduct, or the Secret Service conducted a search abroad, or they conducted an investigation abroad, but there's a headquarters for those people, and that headquarters is in Washington, and the Constitution may not have, con the framers may not have contemplated what to do about abroad, but we can go after the headquarters, and we can think about the Constitution as, as constraining the decisions of those more senior officials, and so you solve the extraterritoriality problem by saying that's not really extraterritorial, it's all intraterritorial. It all happened here, even if the tentacles uh, reached outward. So. Um, I'm not sure that that's the most persuasive, I mean, that's kind of a formalist response, but he's definitely onto something. So. Fair enough. So I was uh, invoking the, uh, the idea of, of flexibility or standards, um, in part because I was trying to show that uh, the Bill of Rights, as it was initially conceived, uh, was uh, thought it was going to apply in a particular context, which was municipal authority. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, that, and it's true not just of the Fourth Amendment, it's true of the Bill of Rights generally. And uh, so, and it was the, the, the rules and practices and conventions that were in standing behind those rights had some forms of definite meanings uh, that had no real application outside the United States in a very different context extraterritorially, which would ordinarily be where, uh, well, I mean, I don't even think the Fourth Amendment can, is imaginably applicable in the world of the founding era at all. But in any event, in general, the, the Bill of Rights would not apply in those kind of circumstances at all. Um, they, would, they wouldn't fit those circumstances. That the law of nations had defined also a set of institutions and rules that would fit the context where a state is exercising its jurisdiction outside of its own territory, mostly in a conflictual context of war or other coercive situations. So, and that, what I would, the point about standards was to say that after World War II, with the expansion of the Bill of Rights and the, um, the expansion of the scope of the Bill of Rights and the implement, you know, the, 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 
the, the greater flexibility that we show with respect to the uh, way we interpret those rights, including balancing tests and so on, makes those rights you know, immalleable enough that they can apply to virtually any situation. We just have to define the purpose for which we want them to apply, which would not have been true before then. So that, that is, it becomes plausible to think about applying the Bill of Rights to a situation where it would not otherwise have applied previously because we've reinterpreted the scope of those rights and made them much more flexible. Now, Therefore, okay. Justice Brennan. And are. Justice Brennan, I would say, was, I think he's re in some intuitive way reacting to the idea that uh, international law isn't providing the kind of um, uh, protection to rights that he thinks is appropriate, which would have been where we would have looked. So in Verdugo or Cadez, for example, just Chief Justice Rehnquist cites, uh, I can use Justice Rehnquist at the time, uh, 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 cites as evidence that the Fourth Amendment wouldn't apply outside the United States that uh, when, when American vessel, naval vessels took prizes on the high seas in the early period after the adoption of the Constitution, no one ever suggested when they seized a ship for violation of neutrality or whatever that they had to have a warrant or that the Fourth Amendment applied at all. So evidence that the Fourth Amendment didn't apply. But of course, what did apply was international law, which had very similar standards that required a problem of cause. There were courts which would adjudicate. Damages were awarded for. Uh, seizures which were not made in accordance with problem of cause and so on. So that, that drops out of his picture. So I, what I, I think what I'd say to Justice Brennan is you're, you're trying to reconfigure the Fourth Amendment to apply in a circumstance where it would not have applied before because the kinds of institutions and standards which were, uh, which filled that gap before, effectively filled that gap, no longer filled the gap in the same way. And that I would be sympathetic to the effort to do that, uh, especially given the flexibility of interpretation. And that's a perfect segue into the last question I'm going to ask before we open it up. And that question is both for Jonathan and for Shimen. I learned a lot from your talk about a variety of different things, including comparative law and the dynamics of litigation and how that affects this area of the law. There is a problem that was uh, implicit in how you both framed, not a problem in the sense that it was bad, but a, a challenge in, in how you framed the, the talk where I felt like you sort of kicked this challenge away, and I want you to hug it a little bit, and that's the whole issue of constitutional interpretation. And I want to ask you a specific question about that in the following way, which is to tell me what you think the study of this problem, of the extraterritoriality of the Constitution and its application extraterritorially, tells us about constitutional interpretation. If, if in the course of that you want to get a little into what your view is on, on what the right mode of interpretation is here, so much the better. Um, I'd say two one is sorry. One is a little uh, nihilistic, and one is maybe a little more constructive in answering your last question. I mean, you know, because the nature of what I was doing was, you know, I, I guess, guess descriptive. Um, uh, I, I can afford to duck it and say I don't really. Uh, these examples don't uh, suggest to me that had had this been done. You know, mountains would have moved. It would have been a very different result. Um, I think what, it, what the, the nihilistic part is, my, I guess, my fear that behind these cases we know about. How many other Toscaninos were there? Um, you know, there's really. You know, how many cases are not brought where there's the issue of uh, overseas um, in, uh, actions and, and, and denial or, or whatever, some application or non-application of rights because it's not raised by a plaintiff or not judged by a court. We don't even know about it, and and that's sort of this. This black hole. Um, you know, I talked to prosecutors and they shrug and they said, you know, there's lots of this stuff going on. Look, it's a dirty drug war in Colombia. You know, all through the, you know, and they'll and they'll sort of tell you war stories and you try and collect them and that's great. But um, you know, there are only a half dozen cases, three in the Second Circuit and three elsewhere about you know where courts have to answer. So so who answers these other cases? Are there um, you know occasionally? I think there was a Senate hearing. You know, DEA comes up for for some authorization or appropriation and, and one senator says in the early 80s, uh, I think there, I, we've heard that there's a whole lot of concern sometimes, I mean sometimes American citizens uh, are involved, there I say it, you know, in the, um, you know, things in particular the claim was um, the DEA agents walk out of the room and then the Colombians, uh, you know, work over the guy who might be an American uh, drug smuggler in Colombia and then they walk back in, we got what you wanted, here's the statement. Uh, well, there are no such cases. Uh, I have no idea if it happened, lots, rarely, never, all the time. Um, but I, I guess my problem with, you know, the more constructive answer to yours is um, how would you frame an answer that also talked about the cases that aren't even brought? Um, who do you address it to? Um, what are those rules? Uh, et cetera. What's the, how do they get elaborated? 
So I, I think that the, I mean, there are various canons, obviously, of, of constitutional interpretation, and I think that um, maybe the most useful is to be eclectic, at least, in, in um, learning from what various approaches have to offer. Uh, um, for example, I don't think one needs to be an originalist to find David's exposition extremely helpful and informative, um, nor does uh, one need to uh, necessarily accept particular interpretations of what the purpose of one or another provision is in order to find Alan's sort of um, reminder that we need to be granular in our analysis helpful as well. Uh, I think from my perspective, what I, what I um, find when I talk to people about my conclusions is that I, I do find, at least among a certain group of, of scholars and colleagues, uh, some surprise that I personally don't jump right to this uh, conscience model and say, well, of course, the US Constitution must apply you know, to everyone, everywhere, wherever the US government acts. And as I said, I think that's because I am more sympathetic to this notion of a kind of division of labor, right? <laughs> that there are certain things that the US Constitution uh, regulates and certain things that, that international law regulates, but of course that only is um, effective in actually uh, constraining the government and or protecting individuals if you have a more seamless view of those two bodies of law as being actually uh, synergistic. And so when I focused at least in my remarks on, on, uh, on judicial enforcement, although of course acknowledging, and, and if I didn't explicitly enough, let me, let me remedy that now, uh, a very important um, uh, role for sort of self-restraint, right, and, and executive branch interpretation, all these sorts of things. So many, many forms of legal uh, regulation and constraint that, that don't even get near the courts, but, but from a sort of ex post perspective, uh, I think that gradually what I personally would like to see um, would, be, would be movement towards a greater synergy between domestic constitutional rights and international rights um, of the type that some of this morning's speakers um, were very skeptical, <laughs> particularly, for example, in, in the European context, right, where you do have a very robust regional rights regime enforced by a regional court, and you do have that kind of dialogue and synergy between national courts and, uh, and a regional body that overall, I think, is sort of ratcheting up the self-consciousness of governments when they act throughout the world um, that you know, uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the relevant constituency uh, the, that, that's not only affected by their actions, but ultimately, you know, to which they are accountable in some sort of moral sense, if not an, el an electoral sense, uh, does extend beyond their territorial boundaries. But I'm also keenly aware of the fact that that's a fairly unrealistic vision, uh, which is perhaps why I've not been as vocal in advancing that. Thank you very much. Your questions. And please identify, I think we almost all know each other, but just in case. Ona Hathaway, Yale Law School. Um, I'll ask the predictable Alawaki question. Um, uh, so my view of that is that as a matter of international law, uh, he's identical to aliens abroad. So we can put international law to one side and ask the, um, or maybe you'll disagree with me on that, but um, I see a quizzical look from David, so maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but, uh, but, uh, my sense is that the difference, the key differences are gonna lie as a matter of constitutional law. So whether a US citizen abroad deserves different kind of treatment, different kinds of due process, uh, than does an alien abroad uh, who is uh, similarly situated in all other respects. And I, I guess I wanna make a kind of pointed question and ask you to say what exactly is the difference, if any, between the alien and the US citizen uh, situated like Alawaki, engaged in uh, the war on terror against the United States, or uh, uh, understood as being one of those who's targeted under the 2001 AUMF. Um, uh, what, what differences precisely would you say there are between the U.S. citizen and the non-U.S. citizen? Amen. Uh, why don't we start with Shimon and then David? Well, I mean, as my remarks may be indicated, I share Ona's question. On the one hand, I share sort of the um, gut reaction of, you know, we're targeting a U.S. citizen, and then I step back from that and think, kind of, so what, right? Um, uh, from a constitutional law perspective, and again, I, I am quite confident, at least if they follow their prior precedents, that the Canadian Supreme Court and the U.K. Uh, Supreme Court would, would not, I mean, they would maybe apply international rights and things like that, so it's not like they would, um, you know, duck the question, but they would not necessarily find that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the UK Human Rights Act gave that particular individual uh, any more or less rights than any other individual uh, affected by coercive state action overseas. So it is particular or peculiar to the US 
experience. So if I were to provide an answer for um, a uh, theory that I don't think I actually fully support or endorse, um, it would come from the, the language on the uh, screen up there. I mean, the, the, the notion that the US Constitution in particular was this sort of foundational act that was sort of imagined as constituting not only the government, but the sort of collective act of self-definition, self-affirmation by the people, uh, we the people, uh, uh, to whom I guess al belongs uh, by virtue of, of birth. Um, and, and then uh, also perhaps, right, you'd have to go down the line of, um, well, for example, right, uh, uh, the United States Congress has uh, criminalized, let's say, child sex trafficking or enga you know, engaging in uh, various kinds of extraterritorial conduct on the basis of nationality jurisdiction. So presumably uh, a U.S. citizen overseas is subject to additional constraints, uh, would be you know, obliged to pay taxes, things like that, that non-U.S. citizens are not obliged to do. So there's some sort of story about reciprocal rights and duties that extend beyond U.S. borders uh, that don't exist with, with respect to non-citizens. Um, so a historical story and then a more kind of uh, maybe utilitarian story of, of reciprocal rights and duties, but one that, uh, as you have guessed, I don't entirely buy. Now let me just take two seconds to say that doesn't mean um, I'm unsympathetic to the situation, but it, it's sort of a, it, it's more of a kind of knee-jerk reaction of, wait a minute, are we putting too much emphasis on the U.S. Constitution here? Shouldn't we be looking more broadly uh, at entitlements of individuals, qua individuals? Brief comment from David and then Jonathan. Well, I, I, I think if we're going to talk about it from a historical perspective, there, there is no basis historically for distinguishing in these circumstances between a United States citizen and non-citizen. Um, and again, the Civil War might be an example of where that would be dramatically <coughs> the case, but that wouldn't be the only example in American history. There are many others, I'm sure you're familiar with them. So I don't think there's any historical base. So we'd have to be uh, generating a normative reason now why we should change the practice. And I think that would, that's going to be hard, at least hard for me, because I don't see that whether a person's entitled to due process before they're, say, executed, if that's the right way of putting it, should determine, should depend on whether or not um, they're an American or some other citizen. It seems to be that that's not relevant to the question. So uh, objectionable to me that, to suggest that it, that it would be. So, so, that I, so now, I don't know whether that, but I don't want to be endorsing the policy or even the constitutionality of what happened with respect to Milwaukee or necessarily to others who have been in similarly situated but haven't been Americans. And the whole question about uh, the law of war and how the law of war is being interpreted in this context and whether it really applies. And other, so there are many, many other questions, but I don't think that the significant question is. is Jonathan. I have a, a different kind of skepticism about the weight we put on citizenship. I and mean, we, we, we tell the story about those who are part of our community and we, they're, they're constituted and they have rights and duties and all that's true, but there are people who are um, sort of accidental or briefly or kind of drive-by citizens or, uh, and I'm very mindful as I say this because I'm, I'm writing things on McCarthy era and I know the laws of expatriation and how, uh, how these have been, you know, and, and treason and how these things have been uh, misused for decades. Um, but it does seem that there are, um, and I'm just playing with this really for the first time, but there are people, you know, Hamdi, he's born here, he's a citizen, he has nothing else to do with the country, he leaves, he's raised abroad, he does stuff abroad, and he's before our courts. Uh, how much of a part of our community really is he? Uh, you know, Alaki is a dual national, Yemen and American, he goes abroad. Again, I don't know where this leads, I think the consequence would be that non-citizens here, who are truly part of our community, you know, the tens of millions of undocumented, are, get much more rights, and Americans who are sort of quickly or formally or accidentally Americans um, maybe are no different than the aliens they live among. To be continued, over here. Uh, yes, uh, John McGinnis, uh, Northwestern. Uh, for both uh, uh, David and uh, Professor uh, Golov and uh, Professor Erbson, uh, first about constitutional theory. What I see David's uh, argue, Professor uh, Golov's argument is uh, a kind of translation background. We should uh, understand what uh, international law did uh, in the 19th and 18th uh, centuries and understand maybe therefore to apply the Bill of Rights today even if we didn't do it back then. But isn't one problem with that that in international law the political branches could vary that through political action in the Bill of Rights we have going back to voting rules it's enormously difficult to change a constitutional decision. And so that's just a very, very large difference in translations. It doesn't even clear to me that it's not closer to have nothing than it is to actually have 
the 800-pound uh, gorilla of the Constitution, particularly in the context of uh, foreign affairs uh, and foreign countries, which we're talking about. Uh, Professor Ibsen, I was very taken with your remarks. We've got to begin and look at the individual text of the Constitution. My question is, is there something particular about purposivism that you, were you emphasizing? I, I mean, certainly purpose is relevant, at least to me, in understanding the original meaning of a text, but it's not the only thing, and it may not be the first thing, and if you look at the Bill of Rights, things like the people may invite us to think which people, and even as I was looking at the Sixth Amendment actually has geographic uh, uh, markers which might help us interpret its uh, and so I just wondered what your theory, are you committing to some particular theory of constitutional interpretation by telling us to focus on the particular? Go for it. So uh, briefly, I, mean, I think uh, I'm making an assertion about uh, the history that you're disagreeing with. So that is to say, I do think that, that the political branches of the government did feel that they were constitutionally and otherwise obligated to stay within the constraints of the law of nations when they were exercising um, war and foreign affairs powers. So uh, now whether that was judicially enforceable uh, is another question. And when it, was, when, it, when it became clear that it wasn't judicially enforceable, I think probably doesn't happen until the, the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, now, I don't want to tell you that everybody thought the same thing about it. it was only, everybody was of the same mind about it. But I think that's actually the, the, there's very strong strains in American constitutional history where those limits are recognized as binding on Congress. And I think it's not always clear that anyone cares whether they're binding as a matter of the Constitution or they're binding as a matter of international law because they have, a, as it were, a more monistic attitude about, about the relationship between the two. But basically, my claim is, anyway, that, that they, they, they did think these were constitutionally binding principles via kind of limited powers, understanding of what it meant to have a power over war, or declarations of war, or, or, or piracy, or <coughs> captures, or whatever it was. That these, were, these powers were themselves defined um, by the concepts of the law of nations. So, so, so the analogy holds, then, in a way. I think you're, you're rejecting the history, but not the, not the analogy, if I understood what you said correctly. Alan. Yeah, I certainly don't mean to commit to purposivism as what the only uh, means of interpretation. For purposes of time, I basically condensed two inquiries into one, which can profitably be split. So the first thing you have to do is look at the text of a look at a particular provision and figure out what it means in order to decide how far it extends. So that's the point about interdependence. And then you have the flexibility to select whichever interpretive device you think is appropriate based on a general theory of how to interpret the Constitution. So if you want to look at just the text, uh, original public meaning, original understanding, any species of originalism, purposism, structuralism, whatever you want to do, the point is select from the arsenal of devices that we typically use for analyzing clauses and fold in an analysis of geography into that inquiry. And I selected purposivism here because I think it just starkly highlights the difference between the commander in chief clause and the Fourth Amendment. So it made the point. I think you can fold in many of the points that others on the panel have made. So if you want to talk about the framers understanding of how the United States was situated within a broader international context, that can be folded into analysis of any particular provision. And it may have infected the Fourth Amendment in different ways than the Fifth Amendment or the Sixth Amendment. So I don't mean to commit to one particular interpretive approach, but we just need to think about geography the way we normally interpret as part of the process of normally interpreting it. And Nick Rosenkranz, really picking up on John's question, uh, um, what can we glean from various bits of Bill of Rights text that do seem to give us hints about the answers to these questions? So uh, Alan suggested um, asking about uh, whether the purpose is of kind of creating a, a zone of privacy or uh, um, a, rather a disability on government as two different ways to think about it. Does, does the First Amendment tell us by saying Congress shall make no law, so it's phrased as a disability on uh, government action rather than as a individual right, really? Does that help us to answer this question in the Fourth Amendment context? Does it matter that it says the right of the people to be secure? Uh, in the um, Fifth Amendment context, says no person shall be held to answer for any capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war. Does that help us to think about this question? So it's a particular exception for the military in time of war, presumably 
abroad? Does the fact that we get an exception like that here tell us something about the absence of an exception like that and other clauses? Uh, and then as John says in the Sixth Amendment, uh, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime shall have been committed. Does that help us to answer this question about extraterritoriality? Or is it a fool's errand, really, to look at these words that closely? Who wants to start? Jonathan, you look like you do. No, I, I, I assume you're, you, you've answered the question. I mean, they're obviously not irrelevant. They're highly relevant. I assume that if Congress passed the law saying servicemen in Iraq uh, may not uh, exercise whatever uh, religious or free speech rights they otherwise would have. It would be null and void from the beginning because the First Amendment is, uh, as you say, uh, blocks congressional action anywhere. And that something about, you know, as Alan was saying, you know, notions of reasonableness for a search, uh, if we're investigating, uh, you know, contractors uh, for abuses in Iraq, uh, what is an appropriate search is going to be a much more complicated question because the word is much more complicated, reasonableness, and it's more complicated domestically too. Uh, so I think it, you know, obviously it's easy to gloss, uh, you know, a $20 jury trial rule, um, a, or if, uh, Congress may not do the following, and harder to do the others. And, you know, but having framed the question in, in, in that level of generality, okay, now let's fight about, you know, about reasonableness. And that's, that's I thought, was Alan's answer. Uh, the hard ones still need to be explored. Um, I, I was really impressed with, uh, with your doing so. Yeah, my reaction to that would be, uh, I don't think, I think it's directly responsive, that these kinds of structural and comparative clues where we look at multiple provisions and see that some are affirmatively aimed at Congress and some talk about rights, some have exceptions, some don't, those clues are exactly as helpful or precisely as helpful in the extraterritoriality context as they are in any other context. So if as a constitutional theorist you want to say that that mode of reasoning is an appropriate way of understanding the Constitution, and you would do that in a purely domestic context, you would do that when you're thinking about what the First Amendment means uh, when it's applied outside in that courtyard to a speaker, uh, then it's appropriate to do it when you're thinking about extraterritoriality. If you don't think that those kinds of uh, subtle grammatical clues are useful in general, then they're not going to be useful here. So I'm trying to sort of normalize analysis of extraterritoriality and bring it back into our general approach to the Constitution. I, I think those textual hints that, you're, you, that you've pointed to are useful in helping us understand a little bit about the way the fa framers of the Constitution were thinking about this, or the framers of the Bill of Rights were thinking about extraterritoriality, but only to a very limited degree. Because I, so take uh, the First Amendment. You, you, I, th I thought the implication was if it says Congress shall make no law, that's going to apply everywhere because Congress just can't make such a law. But if Congress makes a law about the military occupation of Germany, that there can be no Nazi rallies or whatever it is, or other kinds of rallies. No one ever was going to suggest that the First Amendment was applicable, even though Congress made a law, because it was exercising a different kind of power, which wasn't subject to the, to the First Amendment. So the language doesn't really change anything. The Fifth Amendment, when comp property is being confiscated all over the world for people who've done nothing other than be uh, nationals of a country the United States is at war with, they can't come back and say, the Fifth Amendment applies, even though it says no person shall be deprived. It doesn't specify a limit, uh, including an American citizen whose property is taken in those circumstances as enemy property, also cannot assert the Fifth Amendment. So I don't, I mean, if, if you want, if, if textualism is your commitment, and then maybe you don't care about what the understandings that surrounded these clauses were at the time, but I think it only gives you a very limited insight into the way that they thought about how the Bill of Rights would actually uh, apply in this problem with respect to the problem of extraterritoriality. Professor McConnell is officially exempt from the rule of having to identify himself. <laughs> um, so, David, I, I thought I heard you say something that might be right, but I still still surprised me enough that I wanted to ask you to elaborate. I thought I heard you say that there was no historical support for distinguishing between citizens and non-citizens with respect to constitutional applications abroad. Is that what you said? Yeah, I'd want to probably refine it a little bit, but yeah, something so like that. So I wanted I to invite you to yeah. tell us more because that I, I, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but that does surprise me. I would have thought, for <coughs> example, uh, habeas corpus, is an, at least as I understood the historian's brief in the Boumediene case that uh, 
that it was pretty well established that um, habeas would apply both to basically to all persons within the, the kingdom, within the jurisdiction, but also to citizens uh, held abroad, but not to non-citizens held abroad. Maybe that's, uh, and, and as I think about other examples, I would have thought, for example, that the takings clause, and if you think about the application of the takings clause to military uh, procurement with, uh, so that you know, the military can't just seize people's property. I think during wartime, they would seize, that would not apply to seizures of enemy property, but that it would apply, say, to seizures of, you know, private property of American citizens abroad. And I'm, I, mean, I think I could think of a number of other examples, and I just wanted to invite you to elaborate on that. Take the example of the, uh, the confiscation of property. So the distinction is not going to be citizen, non-citizens. It's going to be enemy and non-enemy. OK, now, of course, that's going to, uh, there's going to be a, presumably a, a large overlap between enemy and non-enemy and citizen and, or, or non-citizen and citizen. Um, and the, but property could be confiscated without respect to the Fifth Amendment of persons who were enemies and had put their property in a certain situation that fell within the, the rules of the laws of war, which made it subject to confiscation. And in that context, the Fifth Amendment would not apply to either. Now, uh, but if property is taken for procurement purposes, whether it's the property, presumably, of a, uh, of a citizen or an alien, say, inside the United States, then the Fifth Amendment would apply in any case, because you're not talking about enemies. You're talking about persons whose property are, is, is being confiscated and therefore subject to Fifth Amendment protection. So, so th I think that, that just fits the, the story uh, that I've been trying to tell. It's not, the distinction is not between citizens and non-citizens. It's between enemies and non-enemies. And it's not even territorial, because enemies in the United States can have their property taken without regard to the Fifth Amendment rights as, as well. So, uh, so neither territory nor citizenship actually answers the question. In this case, you look to status as an enemy, which is a government, the, the definition of which, as well as the consequences of which, are governed by the law of war. And that's traditionally how it was done in, uh, in American jurisprudence. Now, as far as other examples of what I was referring to in, in responding to the question was, we can take the Kieran case as an example where uh, detention, uh, the, the, the US citizen can be detained in the same way that an enemy can be detained, uh, a non-citizen enemy can be detained. This is, of course, a citizen enemy. Um, the Civil War has, of course, the same character to it. Um, Americans living in London on the outbreak of the War of 1812 who have property on the high seas are enemies because under the law of war, residence in, in, in London makes you an enemy um, and your property is subject to seizure without regard to the Fifth Amendment. So citizenship status doesn't change anything. You're just like any other British national whose property can be seized. So that's, does, that, does that answer? I, I don't, I'm, not, I, I'm not confident enough about the answer to habeas to say that, that it necessarily applies, but I, I, I'm a little skeptical of your characterization of what the brief said, but I, I'm not, my mind isn't clear enough about, about the facts to want to make a clear statement about it. Anybody else here want to make a quick comment on this? We're good? Well, yeah. you know, in a way it's a problem. I mean, you know, I, I guess I do legal history, so I don't want to be uh, totally cynical, but it's a challenge for originalists. I mean, let's, you know, just going with the habeas example in the historian's brief. Um, some are good, some are not so good, but you know, the bottom line behind that is that you know, Paul Halliday has said, you know, yes, it applies broadly here and everywhere else, and Philip Hamburger says, absolutely not, you got it all wrong, you've misread the evidence. You know, I'm reminded almost of, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the people who know best, I mean, whatever, John Baker has not yet spoken. Um, and what it comes down to, in a way, is uh, what Mao and Kissinger, you know, uh, Joe and Lai and Kissinger supposedly talking about, you know, what, uh, what do you think of the uh, French Revolution? I don't know, it's too soon to say. I mean, if originalists want to get their accurate history, and if history actually is done over decades by people going into the archives and doing this kind of backbreaking work, um, it's tough to get quickie answers that are yes or no. Next question. Yes, Trey Childress, it seems to me that so much of the discussion is based on uh, notions of territoriality or even jurisdiction. So the idea is that, of course, the Constitution applies in the United States, 
because the United States has absolute jurisdiction over the United States and perhaps the Constitution would apply to a military outpost because there would be basically the equivalent or at least the fiction that that's part of the United States. And maybe even, of course, the Constitution applies when it amounts to the exercise of U.S. authority against a U.S. citizen occurring abroad, either based on territory or based on a related notion of territoriality that a, that a citizen has continuing relationships with the state and the state has duties and obligations that run to them. I wonder if that's actually really the right way to, to think about this, because all that gets you is, especially when there are conflicts, which I think is what this is about, what happens when it's not here but it's there, which presupposes the conflict between our law and their law, that if, instead of conceiving of it as a matter of territory, 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 we look at it as a matter of interest. So in other words, we ask the question which state, or is the, and put another way, is the United States, in fact, interested in the application of the Constitution there, which would seemingly require some nexus. So of course the United States is interested when it's in the United States, because it's in the United States. But of course the United States is interested when it's a United States citizen abroad, because it's a United States citizen, which means the United States has an interest. But what happens when it's against, uh, the United States exercises its authority against a non-citizen abroad? Does the United States have an interest there? And I think in terms of thinking about that, it also leads to a question I had and this relates to a recently decided Supreme Court case, Morrison versus National Australia Bank, which said that under the facts of that case, you couldn't apply, in absent a clear statement, the court was not going to apply the securities laws to a foreign transaction that happens on, foreign, uh, on a foreign stock exchange that involves a foreign uh, defendant. Well, my question is, suppose Congress now comes back and says, well, that's what we want the security laws to do, securities laws to do. We want the securities laws of the United States to apply to a foreign uh, non-U.S. citizen when they conduct a transaction on the foreign stock exchange in Australia, so long as you can get personal jurisdiction in the United States. Does the Constitution have anything to say about that as to whether or not that's an appropriate use of Congress's powers? So really two questions. One is, instead of thinking about this as territory or jurisdiction, should we think about it as interest? Which state is the logical interested state in having its law be applied, be it constitutional or subconstitutional law? And the second question is, let's imagine that Congress passes a law which totally and only applies to a foreign person conducting a foreign activity in a foreign place and somehow gets jurisdiction in the United States, is that an appropriate exercise of Congress's constitutional authority? Ellen, you want to start? Sure, let me focus on the first question. Um, I'm not sure the interest paradigm works just because there's no reason why the interest would have to be exclusive. So in the choice of law context, a court is basically applying one law or cobbling together pieces of multiple jurisdictions law on different points, but there's a single answer. There's no reason, hypothetically, why multiple states can't be interested in a particular event, and then some mechanism has to exist to decide where a person's going to go. So if a terrorist in a uh, terrorist abroad uh, launches an attack against the United States and the uh, FBI goes and gets him, the FBI may physically have him on foreign soil, the other country has some interest uh, in that person as well, and then it becomes, I guess, a political question if there's no treaty about who has the person. So I wouldn't think of it as interests. I'd think of it as um, sort of the example that I used uh, with the patrol in Afghanistan, there's this little halo of the Constitution that follows certain U.S. actors around and certain people affiliated with the U.S. and the existence of an effect in the United States or an effect on a U.S. interest might trigger U.S. authority with respect to some person. So we think about this, uh, this comes up in personal jurisdiction in the context all the time, both extraterritorial and intraterritorial, that somebody with no connection to a forum whatsoever launches a harm into it, all of a sudden that triggers some authority of the forum state to reach out and grab them, and then we're thinking about when you reach out, how much of the Constitution goes with you. And we can use the metaphor of jurisdiction, we can use the metaphor of interest, I don't think either of them really help us. What we really have to think about is what are the particular texts and, and clauses of the Constitution. And you clearly have thoughts. And I also have a thought on the first part, so with apologies to the neglected second part of your question. Um, I mean, the Canadian Supreme Court in Hape really did apply a conflict of laws approach and, and was very much criticized for doing so because the commentator said, well, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is not just any other law, right? It's, it's the sort of a constitutive instrument, not in the same sense historically as, as the U.S. Constitution, but nonetheless one is, that is viewed as basically defining the terms of the relationship, right, between the government and uh, um, the citizenry understood in, in, in maybe multiple ways in different contexts. Uh, and, and I would have to agree with Alan that it's not in sort of an either or situation, just as the sort of domestic international law protections, not an either or situation, or even as the Hape Court pointed out, um, the particular action there was vis-a-vis -vis a Canadian citizen, but that was deemed not relevant, but the location was the Turks and Caicos, and as the court pointed out, you know, Turks and Caicos law continued to apply 
as well. So I think that, that that's really the sort of um, the leap that we need to take, even, even though in, in my response to Ona's question, I did invoke sort of nationality, jurisdiction, sort of rights and duties as, as perhaps a basis for some kind of special relationship. Uh, in a, a constitution, I think, at least, you know, at speaking, speaking as an international law scholar, not a, but it is a, a different kind of instrument. And I think even the European Court of Human Rights, uh, moving over just for a moment to the international jurisprudence, even though it has tended to be fairly expansive in its uh, view of the sort of restrictions on uh, uh, European government's uh, extraterritorial action, it's still, even in the recent al decision, wants to look at situations in which there's some sort of exercise of what it calls you know, public authority or public powers. So not, not just the exercise of sort of control in a, in a sort of snapshot situation like dropping a bomb, right? But in, in the context of, of something, you know, not quite the, and apologies for throwing out in, in a short answer terms that not everyone might be familiar with, but not quite in sort of espace juridique idea of the Bankovich opinion, but, but in some sort of notion that a constitution constrains you when you're exercising public authority uh, of a certain type, not just when you're um, you know, passing any other sort of law. So it, it, I think that there are analogies to be drawn, but I, I like Alan, would hesitate to, to collapse the two inquiries um, too, too closely. Over to Jonathan. I could just briefly on what I took your second question to be, which is, are there constitutional limitations on the scope of jurisdiction internationally that Congress can, can exercise? Is that correct? Yeah, when Congress passes a law, I mean, obviously Congress could. It could be signed. It could be presented to the president. Right, but what, are there constitutional restrictions that would apply? And I, and I think we go back to the same problem we've been talking about all along. That, uh, traditionally, there were restrictions, and they were found in international law. I mean, the, the state's jurisdiction was defined by international law. It was largely territorial jurisdiction, but there was also some extensions to, with respect to one's own national, state's own nationals and so on. But it was a very limited conception by modern contemporary standards. Well, international law has changed a lot, but so has the constitutional doctrine with respect to whether it binds in any way what, what Congress does. And today, that, that probably would not be a successful constitutional argument. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if we have any Supreme Court cases that say so, but uh, lower court cases certainly have suggested that, so. Look like you have a question. You thought you might have a question. It's been completely answered by the panel. So I'm just gonna give each panelist a minute to say any last things that you wanna say, if you wanna say anything, and then we will adjourn. Yeah. Um, no, I think people have heard enough from me. I'll, uh, I'll give you all one minute uh, head start on your coffee break. <laughs> Likewise, thanks. Okay. I, 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 I agree. Yeah. Your <laughs> thanks for inviting me. Proving yet again that stare decisis makes a difference. I want to thank you all for being a great audience and our panel for being great. Thank you.